If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke, Luke chapter 22. That's where we're going to start this evening. And amen for, for God's love for us. Uh, and that He loved us enough that He gave His only begotten Son to die for us. And then that's not where the love ends, but once we accept His Son, that He continues to love us as a father loves a child. And so what we're going to talk about today are some lessons that, that we need to learn or that we can learn that, that God has given us the ability to learn through those times where, you know, are hard, right? Through those times that we suffer and we go through trials and, and tribulations in our life. Luke chapter 22, we'll read verse... 30 and 31 and then verse 32 and then we'll pray. So we'll start in verse 30. It says that she may eat, to, uh, Jesus is talking to his disciples. It says that she may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, thank you for tonight. Lord, thank you for this perfect word that you've given to us. Lord, thank you for these lessons that we can learn. Lord, the, the ways that we learn them aren't necessarily easy or the, you know, what we would want. Lord, but we know that you love us and that there's a purpose in everything that you put us through. And so, Lord, we pray that you meet with us here tonight. Lord, that you get me out of the way and that your spirit can speak through me and through your word. Lord, we love you for all that you've given to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to focus on verse 31, really. Uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about some of the lessons that have learned, which would be verse 32. But, but here Jesus is getting ready to go to Gethsemane. Jesus is ready for the end of his life to be offered up as that sacrifice for sins. And he's eating with his disciples. And, and could you imagine eating with the Son of God, you know, at the la what's, what's known as the Last Supper, and him turning to you and says, Simon, Simon, Right, so you know he's serious because he repeats your name. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, that, that idea of sifting. You know, sifting is defined as separating the finer from the coarser parts. You know, critically examining. I, I do some baking. I, I'm not the baker in the, in the family. Amy is definitely the baker, and she has definitely honed her skills over the last three months uh, that, that we've been home. But I, I did, and, and, I, and I looked online just because there's a debate, right? There's a debate when you bake on should you sift your flour or should you not sift your flour. And so I went ahead and looked up what sifting does. Because, you know, I just recently got a sifter, uh, and I use it probably more than I should, but it's so much fun, right, to, to put the flour in, and then you roll the little roller thing, and, you know, it falls down like snow, you know, reminding me of up north where snow falls, and it's not 1,000 degrees outside. Uh, but that's neither here nor there, right? So, so I looked up, why would somebody sift wheat, right? Why would somebody sift their wheat or sift their flour, excuse me, when they're doing the baking? And, and one of the things I found and, and what the, the, the research said was, you know, when you sift your flour, it's easier to mix with the other ingredients. You know, we're going to talk about sifting and, and, and how we as humans and as the church and as Christians go through sifting. And, and I just started thinking about that, right? And, and I'm kind of getting the, the end before the beginning, but that's fine. You know, that it's easier to mix flour with other ingredients when you sift it. And I'm thinking, well, you know, if God sifts us, we should be easier to mix with those around us. You know, the next one, it says, you know, it breaks up imperfections or any lumps that might have occurred in the bag. And so then I started thinking, well, man, isn't that 
just the perfect example of what sifting does is God is, is, is putting us through something that breaks up our imperfections. You know, that, that knocks off an edge here, knocks off an edge there, so that then again we can be easier to mix with others. And then the last thing that it says was to separate things like the, the husk or, the, or any of bugs, anything extra that have gotten into your flower, right? It helps separate those things. And so I was thinking, again, we're, we're, we're talking about sifting, and here Jesus is saying, Simon, Satan has desired to have you that you may sift you as wheat. Meaning there might have been something that has come into your lives, Simon, that I'm going to use a sifting process to help get out. You know, sifting, if you look at it, is a violently shaking of something. Right? It's not like, if you could hear the flower, you obviously can't, but if you could hear the flower going through the sifter, it would probably be screaming. Because if you've ever seen it done, it's not nice and easy, and, and, you know, it's not an easy process, but it is, there's some violence to it. You know, sifting takes the bad out, but it just doesn't take the bad out. It makes the good better. And so what we're going to see, you know, what we're going to see today in, in tonight's sermon is we're going to talk about sifting and, and the siftings that we go through. You don't have to be saved long to realize that there are times in our Christian walk that we're going to be sifted. That we're going to go through these trials. We're going to go through sufferings. We're going to go through afflictions that are meant to do something to us. The sifting that arises in our lives has a purpose. Everything that God does is purposeful, no matter what we think about it. And that's really what we're going to talk about, is we're going to talk about where we can learn lessons through the sifting process that God puts us through. But we have to be willing to not necessarily give God, you know, the be we have to be willing to give God the benefit of the doubt. You know, God, you know what's best for me. I know I'm going through this. What do you want me to learn, right? You love me as an only child, God. What is your purpose for this? Depending on how we look at, at, at trials and siftings, will determine how we come out on the other end. If that sifting was successful in removing the things that it needed to remove. You know, I, I was talking to Pastor this afternoon as, as we were going through this, and, and I looked at him, and I, I told my wife the same thing before I came. I said, you know, I really don't want to preach this. It needs to be preached, and it's what God wants me to preach, so I'm going to do it. But, but at the same point, if you've preached a message like this, you know what's going to happen. Something's going to happen that's going to test what you preach. And so I'm just praying that, you know, what can I learn? Right? And, and that's the question I want to ask you guys is what can you learn from the sifting or from the sufferings or from the afflictions that you are currently going through? Because there's something that God is trying to show you. You know, we're, we're going to talk about three different people in the Bible and the lessons that they learned to teach us about siftings and what we can learn. And then in the end, we're going to talk about that even though each one of us has a different lesson that God wants to show us, right? Because we're not all the same that there are some things that we can take out of all of the sufferings, right, that we see in all three examples here in the Bible. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5. You know, Peter thought he had learned the lessons. You know, it, it, 1 Peter chapter 5, you know, when Peter, Jesus looks at him and says, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you that ye may sift you as wheat. You know, he says, but Jesus then says, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And you know, then Peter answers and said, and he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both unto prison and to death. You know, Peter says, hey, Lord, I, I know Satan's desiring to sift me like wheat, but I'm, I've made up my mind. I'm going to follow you to death. I'm going to follow you to the ends of the earth. I'm going to go wherever you go and 
and I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. Lord, I've already made up my mind. I've learned everything I'm supposed to, and let's go. Before we read the end of the chapter, or before we get to the end of the chapter, if you're familiar with the story, you already know that Peter denies Jesus three times. And then he weeps over the sin, and he weeps over what he did. He didn't learn all the lessons that he was supposed to learn. But it's those words that Jesus told him, hey, when thou art converted, go strengthen the brethren, right? When, when you learn those lessons, I want you to teach others and strengthen them through your trials. 1 Peter chapter 5, because of what Peter went through, he, you, you see it all through 1 Peter chapter 5, right? In, in chapter 1 verse 7, it talks about the trial of your faith being more precious than gold. The only way you can write, hey, you know what, the trial of your faith is more precious than gold, is if you've actually been through a trial of your faith. Here in 1 Peter 5, we see just, just an interesting chapter uh, that Peter writes. You know, in, in verses 1 through 4, he talks about being a shepherd, right? He talks about being a pastor. You know, feed the flock of God, in verse 2, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. You know how Peter learned that lesson? He learned it through a trial. He learned it through a sifting. You know, we know the story. Jesus looks at Peter the last time he denies him. Peter runs and weeps. The next time we see Peter, he's fishing on a boat. He's fishing. He doesn't know what to do. He thinks he's failed enough to where God was through with him, right? That he failed the trial, that he had enough. Hey, you know what? God's done with me because I failed. And then he looks out on the shore, and who does he see but Jesus Christ? Right? And we know the story. He jumps out of the boat, and he swims to Christ, and, and Jesus then proceeds to ask him a few questions. Peter, do you love me? And of course, Peter sits back and goes, oh, of course I love you, Lord. Why, why would you question that? And then Jesus says this, hey, Feed my sheep. And then, you know, and then Jesus asks him again, Hey, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, Well, of course, Lord. I, I love you. You know that. All right, Peter, feed my lambs. And then we know Jesus asks him one more time, Hey, Peter, do you love me? Now, this time, Peter's getting frustrated because we know how Peter can be sometimes. But he's getting really frustrated but what does Jesus say? Jesus says, hey, Peter, I know you love me. Feed my sheep. You know what Jesus was showing Peter? Hey, Peter, you went through a trial. I'm not through with you yet. I need you to go feed my sheep. That is what you need to do. And so here he's saying, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. The only way Peter knows how to do that and knows what it means to do that is because, one, he went through a trial where he didn't feed the flock, and Jesus never gave up on him and said, hey, this is what I want you to do. And, we'll read, and we read through the book of Acts that that's what he did. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble." Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. There, there's a lot in this section, but, but really, he, he's learned how to be humble. Jesus, Peter learned how to be humble by the things which he suffered. Let's go to John 13. John chapter 13. Verse 7. You know, he says, Humble yourself therefore, uh, uh, therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. You know, it says, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. The only way a person can know that, or the only way the person, excuse me, 
You can know that, right? I know that. That God resisteth the proud but giveth grace to the humble. But the only way that you can believe it, right? The only way that you can really know it is by going through something to where it opens your eyes to it. John 13, verse 7, it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And so what Jesus is doing is they're at the supper, and Jesus stood up, girded himself with a towel, took the basin, and then subjected himself to the lowest of the low jobs that was there in the society and his foot washer. Verse 8, it says, Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet, Jesus, never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. You know, Peter here, you know, he through his life, if you look, he, Peter makes mistakes. But if you look at those mistakes, Jesus is there to comfort him. Jesus is there to, where it says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Peter knows that. Why? Because he went through things. He understands. He saw, you know, there are times uh, in my life, too many to name, where this God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble really, you know, just stands out to me, you know, where I think I have all the answers. I mean, I can, I can remember there's a few times uh, when Amy and I were married. Um, this was a few years after Lily was born, you know, that I thought, everything's fine. Everything's good. We're good. Nothing can hurt us. It's a very prideful thing to say. I am in control. It's all about me. And then you know what happened? God decide, decided to humble us through, through some stuff that happened. And you know, the, the verse says, humble yourselves therefore. Here's Peter saying, hey, you better humble yourself under the mighty hand of God because Peter knows that if you don't do it yourself, God's going to put you through a sifting to knock off that edge, to knock off that imperfection. You know, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Now, here, obviously, in Luke 22, we read, here Jesus is saying, hey, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. You know, back when, when Jesus says, hey, who do men say that I am? And Jesus says, oh, thou art the Son of God. Jesus says, nobody showed you this but my Father. A couple verses later, Jesus is looking at Peter and saying, get thee behind me, Satan. Peter went through a sifting, and because of that, he realized there is an enemy. He realized that Satan is present, and he is seeking whom he may devour. Why? Because, G because Peter had been caught up in some things. Peter got a rebuke because he said the wrong thing. You know, just, just something to note, in verse 9, it says the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. One of the attacks that, that Peter realizes, right, because Peter was left alone and when he rejected Jesus Christ three times, right, nobody else went with him. It was just him uh, standing afar off. He realized that one of the attacks is, is, is during these times of sifting, during these times of trials, during these times of sufferings, is that the devil tries to get us alone. And to feel like that we are the only person who is going through it, who is dealing with this. But we're not. We're not the only one. Peter knew that. Peter says, hey, this is accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. There is somebody who has experienced something that you are going through. And this is one of the points, that one of the lessons that Peter learns is that, hey, this is for other people. Right? There are other people who have gone through this who can strengthen you, who can help you through this. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, here's what Peter learned. 
during his sufferings. One of the things. It says, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. You know, Peter knew that there's a God who cares. And Peter knew that there is a God who is trying to show us something in these trials. Trying to teach us. Trying to get us to be something. We're not going to preach out of it. We, we, we probably can't preach out this whole chapter. Probably can get three or four, maybe even five different sermons out of it. But he says, what suffering does is it makes you perfect, establishes you, strengthens, and settles you. Right? It makes you a better Christian because of what you've went through. It says, but the God of all grace is there with you. Notice he also says, after that you have suffered a while. Peter knew that suffering will take place, but it is only a short-term proposition. I understand that while you're going through the storm, it doesn't seem like it's, never gonna, it's ever going to end. You know, and, and we'll, we'll look at Paul and what Paul said, right? Paul says, this is minor compared to the glory and eternity. This suffering. It will end. The, the sifting, the storm will end. The God of all grace is there with you, trying to accomplish something in it. So Peter writes 1 Peter 5 based on the things that he learned during his trials, during his, during his sifting. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, we'll look at another person who, who deals with this idea, or, or at least where we can look at this idea of he suffered, he went through a sifting to teach us something. You know, it's a, to change him into the person he wanted to be. You know, it's all throughout the Bible. This idea of, hey, you are going to suffer. You are going to go through something, and God is going to accomplish something in it. If you look, you know, the, the, there's just a, a variety of different stories, all the way from Jacob, you know, where, where he did what he did to his brother by tricking his brother, and then he goes to Laban's house and has tricked himself. Right? He's tricked with Leah instead of Rachel. Works all this time. He tricks again with Laban's, Laban's cattle. And then just some other stuff happens. But within that, he wrestles with God. Right? He wrestles with God. And he just says, God, what is going on? And he, and he wrestles with him. And, and, he, and he fights with him. And, and we know the story in the end. We won't get into it. But in the story in the end, he has a name change. And he has a change of walk. You know, storms in our lives and, and the sifting in our life will change our walk. Will change the way we walk as Christians. Whether for the good, as we'll see, or maybe even for the bad. But in Acts chapter 9, verse 15, Acts chapter 9, we get the call of Paul. Uh, at this time he's Saul. He'll be called Paul. You know, in verse 15. Uh, verse 13. So here comes God going to Ananias. It says, Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. So here's Ananias saying, God, I know you want me to go see this guy, Saul. I heard what he did, and I believe in you, and I'm believing in that way, and he has papers to arrest me. Verse 15, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Imagine being called by God. Imagine being called to the mission field. And in that call, you, you know, you're, you're praying and you're reading and you're just thinking about it and, 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 you're, and you get this call to the mission field, praise the Lord. And then God says, oh, by the way, I want you to go for me. 
but I'm going to show you great things you're going to suffer when you go. I, I, I think about this, and, and I think, you know, we, we like to put ourselves into these places of biblical characters and say, well, you know, if I was Paul, I'd still go. I don't know. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. You know, Paul uh, doesn't do it in a bragging way, but, but, you know, Paul tells us what he went through. Paul tells us the things that he suffered. And what we're going to see is because of Paul's sufferings, we're going to see the things that he wrote to us and the things that he learned that we can learn as well. Verse, 20 through, uh, verse 22, it says, Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, saved one, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false, er, false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things, right? So this is all just the physical stuff. Right? This is just all the physical stuff that Paul went through, that Paul was put through. So, but besides those things, which are without, right, physical, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. You know, Paul suffered some things, but God showed it to him. Paul, God said, hey, Paul, you're going to suffer some things. But you know what Paul does? Paul suffers he does. I mean, this, this is a list that I don't want to go through. I don't even do half of what he went through. I know what it's, you know, I, I know some things about, you know, the care uh, of, 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 the, of this church, but he had a lot more than just one church that he was caring for, that he was getting letters from. But Paul knew something. Let's go, if, if we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, let's just jump over to the next chapter, chapter 12, and we're going to see what, what happened to Paul. And this is, this is what happened, and this is what needs to kind of happen with us, too, sometimes, as we go through, and we, we go through the sifting, we go through the suffering process. You know, in verse 4, of, of chapter 12, we'll read in verse 4, it says, How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Right? You can look at Paul, and man, man, Paul's a great Christian. Man, look at that guy. He is, I mean, whoo. Paul's saying no, right? Don't, don't think that. I would rather you think me a fool. It says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, what that thorn is, we don't know. I like to think of it like this, because it says um, the messenger of Satan. Again, what did Peter learn? Peter learned there's an adversary, right? What's Paul going to learn here with this thorn? Hey, that there's an adversary, right? That there's an adversary that has sent this person it says to buffet me. Now, whether I, I, here's what I think it is. I'm going to step to the side because it doesn't explicitly say. Here's what I think it is. Right? I think it was a guy who constantly went around and followed Paul, constantly going, you know, Paul, you're not as good as you think you are. You know, Paul, you, th you think you saw something, Paul. I don't think you saw anything, Paul. Why don't you tell me what you saw? 
right? Because what does it say? It says there's a messenger of Satan to buffet him, lest I should be exalted above measure, right? So here's this person who follows Paul around to humble him. Verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. Here Paul is, is praying what most of us would pray. Lord, I can't handle this. Please take it away. Please take it away. And, and you know what God says? And He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What happens to Paul in his sufferings is he has a change of view. Here Paul is focusing on himself. Uh, on, on this messenger of Satan, on this thorn of the flesh. And he goes to God, like all of us would, and said, God, can you take it away? He just doesn't do it once, he does it three times. And all three times, God says, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Or made perfect in weakness. And so then what does Paul do? Paul changes his mind. Paul says, I'm not going to get rid of it. All right, most gladly will I rather glory in my infirmities. You know what lesson... Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 while I talk about it. You know what lesson we can learn in our suffering? To have a different viewpoint. We're going to talk about the, the, the what we can learn, right? The, the two major themes that we can learn through both of these. But, but what Paul shows us here in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is a change of viewpoint, right? Paul is saying, hey God, can you take this away? Can you take this away? And God says, no, Paul, I can't. So you know what Paul does? Paul says, okay, I'll glory in it. I'll glory in what you have given to me. Are we still alive? We're not live. Oh, they can. Okay. Okay. That's fine. All right. So Paul realizes he has a change of mind, change of perspective. Instead of looking at the sifting, he looks at the sifter. And he realizes, all right, God, what do you want me to do? What is this for? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, here's what it's for. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse number 4 says, Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Right? We who comforteth us, Jesus Christ in verse 3, who is the God of all comfort, comforts us. Why? That we may be able to comfort them that are in any trouble. How can I comfort somebody who is going through a tough time? Well, because Jesus Christ has comforted me. Verse number 5 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. You know, Paul realized something in the sufferings that he went through. One thing that he realized was that Jesus Christ was with him and comforting him as he went through it. But the other reason why Paul went through something was to comfort others. And you know, if we read that passage in verse 6, it says, And whether we be afflicted, it is for your 
consolation and salvation. You know, there are times in our lives that we go through the sifting through no fault of our own. You know, the, the, the common question that Christians ask when we go through something is, why me? You know, why, God, are you putting me through this? That is the wrong view of a trial. God, what do you want to get out of this? Paul knows that there are times when we suffer that he suffered for the sole purpose of somebody else. For somebody else. That they could see God working through him. That they could see something happen in his life that he now can witness to another person. And that's what Paul learned through his sifting. In Acts 27, you know, in Acts 27, Paul is sailing on a boat to Melita. And, and we know the story. Paul, at the beginning, says, guys, we're not, we, we shouldn't be sailing. We shouldn't be sailing, but the ship took off anyway. They didn't listen to him. You know, and, and we read it in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He said he was in shipwrecks three times. Here's one of them. You know, he gets a shipwreck at Mali. You know, he, he's getting ready to go down. They're, they're in this storm called Euroclidon. You know, and, and if you know anything about storms, if the storm is big enough to have a name, it's a big storm. You know, they name hurricanes for a reason. They're big storms. And so here he's on this ship, and, and he says, if you're, if you're there in Acts 27, you don't have to be, but if you are, in verse 21 it says, But after a long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and have gained this harm and loss. Now, you know, Paul stands up and says, Guys, you should have listened to me. But instead of stopping there and going, well, it's too late now. I mean, I'm just going to sit back and relax and you guys, good luck. He says, and now I exhort you to be of good cheer. Again, they're in the middle of a storm and Paul is saying, hey guys, let's, let's be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For the, why? Why can Paul say in the middle of the storm to a bunch of men who are probably scared at this point and saying, hey guys, be of good cheer. There's only one thing that's going to be lost and that's the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. He says it again. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Why can Paul say, guys, be of good cheer because I believe God? Because God told me that the only thing we're going to lose is the ship. Paul can say, guys, we need to be of good cheer in the middle of this storm. No matter how bad it looks, you just stay with the ship and you're going to be saved. Because he went through some things. And God has come through with him through those things. That he realizes that God is a God of all comfort. That he can trust God in whatever he's going through. You know, in verse number 9 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Right? We, we've read this before. I preached through this passage. You know, here is Paul. And, and Paul is in a time of his life that he thinks he's going to die. He's like, this is it. I'm done. We have the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver us, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. You know, Paul learned that no matter how bad it is, no matter how bad it was, no matter how bad it's going to be, God will see us through the sifting. You know, Peter and Paul both learned very similar, similar lessons through their sifting. Slightly different because they are different, but, but, but very similar that God is there. No matter what happens, God is there. Let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2. And we'll finish up with this one. So we saw that Peter learned some things, right? He said, 
Hey, Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan wants to sift you like wheat, desireth to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you. Notice what God doesn't say. God doesn't say, but you know what, Peter? I st I'm stopping him. I'm not letting him do it. He's not going to do it. I'm going to protect you. No. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, I prayed for you. When you are converted, when you learn the things you're supposed to learn, strengthen the brethren. Here, Paul, you know, Paul goes through this, these trials and he gets this thorn in the flesh and, and he asks for God, God, can you please take it away? And, and God says, no. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul, the weaker that you are, the stronger that I look. And Paul says, yep, you're right, Lord. Let me change my view. It's all about you. Here we get the last person who suffers and learns something through a sifting. In Hebrews chapter 2, we'll read it, and then we'll talk about this person in verse, uh, let's see, verse 9. It says, For, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation. Now let's read this. Perfect through sufferings. For both, he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And so what happens is here we're going to talk about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ suffered some things. He went through a sifting. And what did he learn? He learned what it was like to be a man. He learned what it was like to suffer things here on this earth. You know, I, I, I was reading this again just preparing for the sermon, and I love what it says in verse 11. It says, For both he that sanctifieth, talking about Jesus, and they who are sanctified us, are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. We're in the same boat. We go through sufferings just like Jesus Christ went through sufferings. You know, through the sufferings that Jesus Christ went to, he learned what it was like to be a man. Why? For the sole purpose. Let's, let's skip down in Hebrews chapter 2 to verse 17. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. It says, Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Right? Again, Christ wanted to be like a man so he could know what it was like. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. You know what Jesus Christ, you know why Jesus Christ suffered? You know what he learned? He learned what it was like to be a man. He learned what it was like to be tempted, just like as we are. Now he didn't sin, we do. But Jesus Christ learned what it was like to suffer so that he could come up beside us and succor us. You know, that word succor means assistance and support in times of hardship and distress. You know, we've read about Peter and Paul, and, and Paul and Peter knew that God was with them through this trial, and He is. But you know what? Jesus Christ came to this earth to suffer for us so that He could come alongside us in our sufferings and help us. He can come alongside us and say, hey, I know what it's like to go through this. Let me help you. It's not fun. Hebrews chapter 5, you know, Jesus Christ, it says, uh, though he were a son, talking about Jesus Christ, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered and being made perfect. Now that perfect 
doesn't mean sinless, right? Because we already know Jesus Christ is sinless. He didn't have to be made sinless, but it made him complete, right? Jesus Christ now knows what it's like to be a man. Before he was born as a man, he could kind of look down and see and kind of guess. You know, I, I would just hypothesize or I, I would guess, predict that he would just look and kind of guess at what, what it would like to be a man, but he didn't know. He was God. He's never experienced this walk. And here he comes, and he learns, and he was made perfect by the things which he suffered. You know, he became the author of eternal uh, salvation unto them that obey him. But though he were a son, yet learned he obedience. Right? Jesus Christ learned obedience by suffering. You know, that's a picture for us. You know, Jesus Christ became obedient unto death, even the death on the cross in Philippians chapter 2. Jesus knew the price that he was going to pay, but he still did it anyway. He still went. You know, sometimes when we go through a sifting, when we suffer, when we go through a trial, taking the next step is enough. Sometimes taking that next step is all that God wants us to do. Why? Because in I am strong in your weakness. Because it shows the power of God. So what, what are some of the, the, the things we can learn? Right? We, we talked a little bit about a few things here, right? With Peter saying that there's Satan, there, there's an enemy around. We talked about Paul changing our focus. Right from, from off the stuff that's happening around us, off the storm into Jesus Christ. And we, we talked about Jesus and, and, and that we learn obedience through the things that we suffer. But there's a couple things that, that, that I saw that, that's similar through all three stories, through all three trials, through all three, three siftings. And the first one I saw is that God is with us. Whether we see Him or not, whether we think he's there with us or not, he is with us. You know, Hudson Taylor, you know, great missionary, opened up China uh, for a lot of missionaries to go over, started the uh, Inland China missions. Uh, he says, he, he was quoted by saying, what then? I am not careful to inquire. I know there will be tears and fears and sorrow. So what Hudson Taylor is saying, hey, I'm not going to ask because I already know that if I'm going to follow Jesus Christ, if I'm going to do his will, if I'm going to do what he wants me to do, there will be tears, there will be fears, and there will be sorrow. But then he says, he also knows this, and then a loving Savior drawing nigher, drawing closer, and saying, I will answer for the morrow. You know, no matter what's going on in our life, you know, there, there are some families in this church who are struggling. Right? That, that there are some families who are dealing with grief of losing a loved one, uh, uh, of sickness that, is, that has come into their home. God is with us, whether we see Him or not. God is working out His plan. The, lover, the loving Savior draws near to us and says, hey, you worry about today, I will take care of tomorrow. You know, God is with us. That, that's one thing I see. The, the last thing I see, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, and we'll, we'll end it here. We can use our sifting we can use the trials we go through to comfort and strengthen others. You know, if you look at the life of Paul, Paul is constantly gaining strength and comfort by other people coming to him in his time of need. Let's read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 5. It says, for this uh, verse 4 it says, For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know, right? You know we're suffering. We already told you we're going to suffer tribulation. Verse 5 says, For this cause, 
When I could no longer forbear, right? I, 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 am, I, I can no longer go on. I can no longer walk this way. I can no longer do what I'm supposed to do. I sent to know your faith lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain, right? So he's like, I'm going, Paul is saying, I am going through a very tough time right now. I'm g- going through great tribulation or a lot of tribulation, and it's a great tribulation, but a lot of tribulation. And he says, for this cause, I can't go on. So what I did was I wrote to you to see if you were still following. Because I can't, I mean, I don't even want to think about what would happen if the tempter came and our labor be in vain, right? That you're no longer following the Lord, that you're off doing something else. Verse 6 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, it says, But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren... We were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. Paul got comforted from somebody coming to him and giving him a good report in his trial, in his, while he is being sifted. You know, there are times in our lives where we just go through something that's really hard, really difficult. And we don't know how we're going to get out of it. But praise the Lord that there is somebody who's gone on before that has. And that can come up next to us and say, Brother, it's hard. Let me tell you how God got me through it. And He'll do the same for you. There's... A lot of stuff going on. There's always a lot of stuff going on. You know, it's e- it's it's easier said than done. You know, you know, we 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 like to think that, yeah, when I come up to that storm or when I come up to that sifting, I'm gonna pass it with flying colors. And and let me tell you, that doesn't always happen. You know, Peter failed, but you know what? Jesus didn't leave him. You know, we're going to mess up when we go through trials. We're going to mess up when, when we have a, a something that God puts us through. But you know what? Jesus knows what it's like. And he can come up next to us and say, hey, I'm here for you. Let's go and pray. And then we'll be done. Just remember to pray for each other. To help each other. To comfort. Be a comfort to each other. Let's go and pray. Lord, thank you for tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, for who you are. Lord, we thank you for comforting us in our times of need. Lord, we understand that there are times where we will be tried. But Lord, we are thankful that you are there with us. And Lord, we pray that as we go through this sifting, as we go through these trials, Lord, that we can look to you and we can learn what you want us to learn. We thank you for the examples that were put in the Bible for our admonition, for our learning. Lord, we thank you for never leaving us or forsaking us. Lord, we pray that if there's someone here who's going through a trial, going through a sifting. Lord, we pray that you be with them, that you comfort them. Lord, that you allow us as a church to be a help, to be a comfort. Lord, we thank you for all you've given to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.